Welcome to the Monday morning edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 548. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 11th of the 11th. It's St. Martin's Day and Armistice Day here in Europe. The day we remember when our leaders sacrificed a whole generation of their youth for the sake of vain glory. Okay, welcome to the Monday show. Uh, it's Veterans Day here in America, and we thank those who fought and put themselves in harm's way for our freedom here uh, and around the world. It's Armistice Day over in England, um, 11th hour of 11th day of 11th month. Um, how does England celebrate differently than America? I've been thinking about the celebrations today. When I when I was brought up, it, it mattered enormously to me. My father, who was a, a lieutenant in the Royal Navy and did the North Sea convoys and lost very many of his friends, used to put me on his shoulders as we went to the war memorial and, and wept as the names were read out. And although I didn't understand very much of history aged five, I got the sense that this was a, a devastating conflict. It's very clear that our society is trying to remember, but I think our society is muddled in terms of its of its categories. So um, we're probably going to talk about the difference in politics and spiritual understanding later on in the show. I think Armistice Day throws up exactly the same dynamic. We know what the politics of the last hundred years have been. I think our society has completely forgotten the spiritual dynamics that underlie them and that's partly why there's such a confusion so we we've turned armistice day to answer your question more directly into a kind of heritage event where you have gun carriages and bowler hats and uh uh and, and, and the establishment turns out in all its uniforms but they seem to me to have no understanding there is no commentary on what went wrong and why it continues to go wrong in our lives today it's interesting because in World War One we lost a generation of men. Uh, World War Two we lost another generation of young men. Uh, almost did the same thing in Vietnam. But lost a, a whole generation, and you know we lift these people up for the bravery and, and their heroism. And yeah, there's a lot of politics that went on at the leadership level um, that caused that. A lot of mistakes and a lot of uh, good decisions as well. Um, but I just want to you know, take a moment and remember them in our, in our show. Before you guys get too far, please like the show in Facebook and YouTube. Uh, don't be afraid to subscribe to the show. You'll be notified instantly when there's a new episode, if you click that little bell next to the red uh, rectangle. Uh, and comments. You guys are too smart for us. Uh, we love the comments. We read the comments. And clearly the show continues on after I click the uh, end button here in the comments. You guys are wonderful. And uh, it, it's been just amazing to read that over the last couple months, uh, your, your thoughts and adding to what we say. I appreciate that very much. Kevin, okay. can I? Yeah, go ahead. You're, you're not expecting this, but can I take 30 seconds to? Oh, please, uh, absolutely. Could continue the, the spiritual commentary that, I mean, I hope we'll carry on the trajectory in the things we talk about, but it occurs to me one of the things that the church hasn't done is to understand how both the First World War and the Second World War were predicated upon the failure of the church to be Christian. So that uh, the, the, during the First World War, the run up to it, the church bought into nationalism in a way that was, that utterly betrayed the roots of international Christianity. And, and as we approached in the 1930s, the church refused to recognize the reality of evil, and it refused to speak out unconventionally. And the reason I think that matters is that the, the deaths from both world, war, world wars can be laid partly at the feet of frightened Christians in our culture. And, and it's happening again. The church has got frightened in our generation and won't speak out about evil. And if we were to learn anything about the spiritual commentary of Armistice this day, it ought to be that the church has to find the courage of its own gospel integrity in every generation and be willing to confront culture and politics even when it costs us. We're not doing much better than those other two generations did and, and, and we should be. And what that means, I think, is when we look at the way in which the church does politics, as I think we're about to, we need to draw out the spiritual narrative that underlies the political 
story of events. So over over perhaps to the story of events that you're about to initiate. Okay. Well, I, I want to talk about Anglicanism kind of, let's do the 30,000 foot level here. There has been, you know, lots of attempts to have reformation within the church. And entities like the Global South and GAFCON have been at the forefront of that for the last, you know, ooh, obviously GAFCON 10 years, Global South a little longer, where they have watched the overall leadership of the Anglican Communion not do its job and have from time to time got together and said, stop, you guys aren't doing it right. And I see now there's more of a competition in my, in my eyes, this is the political level, between GAFCON and the Global South. And I say that because the Global South just put out a covenant, something that's been fought for and argued for uh, at the Anglican communion level for a dozen or so years. Uh, and GAFCON, if this document goes forward, is going to be lesser in the eyes of the Anglican communion. And it seems to me, and I hate to say this, but is GAFCON going to dissolve? Is this the covenant? Is the, is the only way forward? And uh, I, I really want to hash this out with you on a political sense and on a spiritual sense because it, it looks like there's two factions in heaven fighting. And I, I want you to, to, to fetter this out. First, you know, why do good guys fight, George? What, what, am, I, what am I seeing here? Uh, well, you are, Kevin, you're right. There is a war in heaven, and the war is now being waged within the, con the traditional or conservative world. Conservatives have been notorious for breaking off and fighting each other and each side wanting to be king of the, king of the hill. What we have right now is an unspoken statement by the Global South that GAFCON's had its day. Now, let we, we need to pull out of, from that the Jerusalem Declaration, the theological underpinnings of G GAFCON, and the work that it's done so far. But well, as uh, a let, but as an as an, an entity, as a as a political body, GAFCON has failed. That is my take on the Global South Co Global South I, Covenant. I agree with you, and I want to back the, our viewers up so we they, they know who's who helped on this covenant, who's uh, in the Global South and what leaders were speaking of. Uh, who is in the Global South? Well, the Global South traditionally had been those conservative churches that needed Canterbury. So Munir and Nice would never break with, Munir and Nice of Egypt would never break with Canterbury because he needed the Archbishop's help with Egyptian internal policies. The Indian Ocean, uh, Burundi, uh, the weaker economically uh, and politically African, African provinces and the uh, Chinese-dominated provinces of Southeast Asia. So if you speak in cultural terms, those, those provinces that placed a high uh, level of deference to the leadership, who were good to the Archbishop of Canterbury no matter what he did, against uh, the newly dynamic and independent, if you will, churches of Uganda, uh, Rwanda, Nigeria, Kenya, churches that had come to a sense of their own maturation, that they're entities with their own strengths and weaknesses. So you had that initial, uh, and everybody was happy with that. We knew, uh, on the, it, we being GAFCON, knew that uh, Munir and Nice couldn't join GAFCON because, for instance, he couldn't go to the Jerusalem conference the first time it was held because the Coptic archbishop, a Coptic patriarch at the time said, Egyptians may not go to Jerusalem. Now, Munir Anis is not going to publicly say that's not the reason, but that was one of the reasons. Yeah. Um, because he had to play, be, being a minority church, being a minority within a minority in Egypt, he had to play ball. Uh, we've now seen that shift away. And what we're seeing is we have now have, for instance, uh, Foley Beach is now the vice chairman of the Global South movement. Uh, we have what? this I mean, covenant... <laughs> Well, how did that happen? <laughs> well, he, he, I'm now going to give you my impression and my opinion, and I don't know if it is factually correct, and I do encourage people who know better to tell us. Mm -hmm. GAFCON had a found, GAFCON's strength were its theological foundations in the Jerusalem document. Article 9 of the Jerusalem Declaration 
basically said we will we do not recognize those spiritual leaders who have crossed the line and fallen into apostasy that has prevented some american bishops uh from signing up to gafcon because that would like make them liable for being deposed like mark lawrence or keith ackerman and we have some english bishops who uh though very enthusiastic and supportive of everything that gafcon has said and doing they can't if you will buck the establishment and say that the Archbishop of Canterbury or the Bishop of Liverpool, for example, who are people who propound doctrines that are false, we're no longer in fellowship with. So for political dynamic reasons, that has been uh, problematic. Now, some people have said, well, we just don't give them spiritual authority over us. We can still give them honor and dignity and legal authority. But people have not wanted to split that hair. So there has been a push for a middle way that allows people to stay uh, in, in good graces with Canterbury, while at the same time say, here is where I stand and I'm on the good guy side. So GAFCON was too rigid for some people. And the Global South has exploited that vacuum by coming up with a non-theological document. This is this Jerusalem, the, the Cairo Covenant released by the Global South was written by lawyers. It wasn't written by theologians. And it basically is trying to thread the needle of how we can be together in fellowship and form an Anglican unity, and this is the way forward. Now, I, before I get too far into the weeds there, this is a direct challenge to GAFCON. It makes GAFCON irrelevant for all intents and purposes, and it negates the work of the last 10 years. Now, we can discuss why this has occurred and what we think is behind all this, but this is a direct challenge to GAFCON, that GAFCON's had its day in the sun, and it's time to fold up shop and go away. So I'm I'm about to, to run the risk of being naive, but but I wanted to pull that something out that Kevin said in our earlier conversation, which wasn't recorded, but you might want to expand on it. I mean, Kevin was asking questions, when is a church not a church? And asking about the ecclesiology of Anglicanism at the moment, the Anglican communion on the one hand, GAFCON and now the Global South. George, is it too simplistic to say that, that GAFCON was in an unusually un-Anglican way trying to do the kingdom of heaven and the Global South is resorting to, uh, to, to, to um, Erastian politics? Is that the main difference between the two? I think that is a difference. Um, I would, well, let me, let me fill that out and then add some. Part of the, part of the problem of GAFCON was that it was archiepiscopally led. So that meant when you had a change of primate, a province would flop in and then flop out of GAFCON. The Global South, the covenant is now for bishops and provinces and dioceses, so that it's, it's giving itself a broader base so that you don't have the West Africa and Tanzania problem of every time they elect a new archbishop, it flops in, then flops out, then flops in again. So the structure of GAFCON, was un-Anglican in that it mimicked a uh, metropolitan Catholic worldview, which at least from an American perspective has never existed. The, the Erastianism charge against uh, the Global South, I think is a hard one, but I think there are some truths to that, which the Global South is going to have to disprove. Uh, it's it's trying to find a middle way of finding a political solution to a theological problem is, in essence, an Erastian response. Um, so, yes, Gavin, I think you're right, but I don't think they would think of themselves in that way. But and that's from why, someone looking at it. That's why Kevin's question is so important, because if you're not a church, you have to find other models to define your relationship with. And what we have here is two different models, neither of which appears to have got it right. Well, Roland Williams wrote a report some years ago telling people what Anglican was, and he said Anglicanism is diocese to diocese relationships. And mm -hmm. he, he left out the primatial level and said that doesn't ever work. But he wanted to be sure that people understood that in his, in his mind, Anglicanism worked at a diocese to diocese relationship level. And I, 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 I see the future in that. That was, well, actually, here's the funny thing. That was a letter to John Howe, Bishop of Central Florida, where yeah. Bishop Howe was trying to sort of understand where Williams was standing 
vis-a-vis -vis the Episcopal Church and the dissident diocese within the Episcopal Church. And Rowan Williams' response was this letter that you said. But the joke that was within the Diocese of Central Florida, John Howe had no real relationship with his parishes. Um, that was, in other words, we have this fig leaf of episcopacy, but we, but I, there are very few, if any, American diocese, Episcopal diocese, of which I know, where the bishop is the father and God is, if you will, the pastor to his clergy. The model of the bishop administrator that you see once every two years uh, in your parish, and whom you may see once a year at convention, that's the norm. So even the even the diocese to diocese format is not replicated in the reality of life in the ground in the parish world but that's that's a different issue but uh. it is so i is the long-term goal and yeah i read the covenant uh i i'm certainly you know have had ears to the ground with gafcon people and with uh, uh global south people are we long-term going to to fold gafcon into the global south what what are we seeing happening here well, I'm offering opinions. I have no clue what GAFCON leadership Ben Kwashi is thinking right now on this point. Mm -hmm. I do think it's telling that the chairman of the uh, chairman of GAFCON is the vice chairman of the Global South Anglican movement, uh, Foley Beach. Why would Foley Beach do this? Well, let's just throw out some hypotheticals. That's the situation. In, the situation in England is dreadful, <laughs> and this was put. Uh, on, on many levels, <laughs> yes. but from an, an organizational level, the situation for conservatives in the U in the UK is dreadful. Gafcon, under its former uh, Secretary General Peter Jensen, was unable to admit to mistakes and unable to act upon mistakes. They just kept pushing, shoving good money after bad. An example is AMIE and uh, Andy Lyons. Uh, Lyons was chosen by Peter Jensen to be the bishop in England for those, for the future ACNA of England, and that has not worked. And we've had many shows where we've discussed that. And the Foley Beach has been most unwilling to cut the cord and start over. And there have been time and again, the disparate groups in England have gone to the ACNA, gone to GAFCON and said, look, here is how you do it. You need to put together a consortium of bishops that that include the evangelical and the Anglo-Catholic and the and they, you, you need to have a, a, a an Episcopal leadership that is reflective of the reality on the ground, not giving the prize to one sliver of the uh, of the conservative movement. Well, Gafcon ignored that. It's now for two years. Yeah. And on top of that, you've had that that segment, which GAFCON favored is imploding. We now have the Jonathan Fletcher crisis, where the conservative evangelical movement, signified by the mega churches in, in London and Oxford, I, I won't go into names, are basically shown to be tainted by their cover up of sexual and um, spiritual abuse. So, my God, this is, you know, how do you build upon that? Well, you either cut your losses and shut it down, or you just sort of allow it to soldier on, but then create a new entity. The global well, there, there, is, there was, George, I like the way you described it, and I endorse every word. Uh, I, I wanted both cheer and howl, howl with frustration at the same time. There is, of course, a third one, and that is you, you, you man up and you admit your mistakes, however embarrassing they are, to institutionally. And that seems to me to be what some of the people we've been talking about have failed to do so then because they fail to do that it's called repentance it's a technical christian term but because they fail to do that you quite rightly are saying you one of your options is to walk away uh, and and to leave it to fester and 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 gosh uh, the, the situation we face at the moment is is, is really terrible the there have been profound complaints about the way in which uh, rod thomas has, has been seen to be cozying up to paul bays in the diocese of liverpool and many of the constituency who looked to him to choose the integrity of kingdom values over the Erastian convenience of the of the church are, are profoundly and deeply dismayed. There's the problem in which the society appears to have decided to the Anglo-Catholics have decided to back their own 
sexualized culture rather than their their ecclesiology in the way they have appointed people let the reader understand we could go back into these details if we wanted but it's the the, the major players are not holding to their principles and the consequence of mixing that with this appalling hole beneath the waterline that um uh that the sexual scandals have, have created means that, that it's a complete and utter disarray it's 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 going to be very difficult if GAFCON walk away, as you suggest they might be, um, because what will be left? Well, get, but this, the structure of having of morphing into the Global South Anglicans is that you allow the Jerusalem document to stand as a theological declaration of principles, but you jettison the structure that has been built on top of that politically and morph into the Global South Anglicans which is a more workable, more lawyerly structure that allows uh, uh, those people who cannot sign on to Article 9 to have a place within the conservative movement. Um, the problem with not being able to sign on to Article 9 is that the, is there any likelihood that some form of new leadership within the Global South would emerge to take responsibility for those who uh, want to cling on to acna type principles in england it, it it looks like that kind of organization couldn't produce that sort of leadership if gafcon tried and failed and won't admit to its mistakes and start again how is the global south going to take its place it can't can it no i don't think so and part and uh, one of the unspoken things are people um there's a great the human factor plays a major role in this the first leadership of gafcon archbishops was the right man at the right time at the right place uh, Peter Akinola, Henry Arambe, uh, I go through the entire list of people. They were archbishops that could work with Americans and English and Australians and the cultural differences between the, those churches and their churchmanship and they're just the way they interact as human beings. Their strength and personalities were able to rise above that. The second generation fell short. Nicholas Oko uh, was very Nigerian, as was Peter Akinola, as is Peter Akinola, <laughs> but he was limited by his Nigerian worldview, such as that we've had the consistent attacks by the Church of Nigeria on the integrity of the ACNA. We don't like to talk about that. We don't want to go raise that show. But, you know, the Church of Nigeria has basically decided to say, screw you to ACNA, and do its own thing. Whereas, uh, you know, that is the second generation's leadership's the choice that they've taken. So how does that, so the new generation, there's a new primate in, in Nigeria, uh, there's a new primate in Uganda, we don't know where these people are. And in this vacuum has stepped the global south and people like Bob Duncan and Phil Ashey and Foley Beach are sliding the successful bits of GAFCON out of that structure before it collapses and not waiting really to see what's going to come with these new archbishops. Intrigue. I mean, <laughs> who knew coming into uh, the fall of 2019, we would see something like, now, this is our analysis at the 30,000 foot level. We could be completely off base because of the lack of, communication, lack of communication from GAFCON and the Global South about the real purpose behind these documents. Uh, certainly, uh, we're not the only people who feel this way. Stephen Null has written a document that we published in Anglican Inc. And he largely goes about defending the ecclesiology of GAFCON. And I happen to agree with Stephen Knoll on this point. I do too. I, and that I is one it. of the strengths of GAFCON. And the, the, that is one of the if if we're going to have a fire sale of assets of the company that's one of the assets that they want to sell quickly because it's worth something the, the jerusalem declaration and the theological underpinnings but see he, he, here's my point kevin it's taken steve Knoll, who's not in a leadership position politically within gafcon but is theologically and one of the elders theologians of this movement he is the only one who has spoken up and said hey wait a second why are you taking this course, which is a direct attack on the legitimacy of GAFCON? And if Steve Knoll is making these comments, which I happen to agree with, um, what is this saying about the political turmoil? 
within the conservative movement. I always have to go back to street cred. Every time I would talk off the record to a Global South primate about why they would not join GAFCON and would stay with the Global South is Archbishop of Canterbury gives them street credit, street cred. They can't fight the fight that they want to fight in the culture that they're working within without having the Archbishop Canterbury's name and seal behind them. And it's a, it, it, my, and, my, my disagreements uh, with the communion partners, the Episcopal Church group that sure. is sort of the successor to the old American Anglican Con Con uh, AAC, its Council of Bishops, they have an idealized vision of who the Archbishop of Canterbury is. And so they look at the office, they look at the institution. It's like thinking of the crown, not the actual person wearing the crown. My difficulty is the actual person holding the title, sitting in the cathedra at Canterbury, Justin Welby, who Justin Welby will say one thing to a Western audience and will say the complete opposite thing to an African audience. And we've recorded that. We've, you know, that's not news to anybody. Oh. Yet these American mm -hmm. bishops still think, tell their clergy, don't worry. Welby is our savior from the crazies in the Episcopal Church. Friends, if you believe that, I got a bridge in Brooklyn I'd like to sell you. Um, <laughs> Well, be no, the man yeah. is is the wrong man at the wrong time in the wrong place. However, the respect for the office, I can't, you know, uh, be disagreeable with that. I understand people who respect the office of the See of Canterbury, just like uh, I have people in my neighborhood who don't like the current president of the United States, but respect the office of the president. Uh, same with the prime minister over in England. Uh, but see, here's, people, here's, the, here's, the, know, here's the thing, Kevin. If, if you, now I'm speaking as an American. Sure. The American Episcopal Church had no ecclesial relationship with the Church of England until around the U.S. Civil War. Just after the church, it, yeah. I mean, I mean, it took a hundred years, uh, not hundred years, it took four score and seven four years skills, right. <laughs> for the, uh, uh, that's the Catholics next door. Ignore them. Ignore them. <laughs> They're on to you. <laughs> God, the, the, oh, these French Catholics, they play the Angelus whenever they get a chance. Oh, my. But the, it's not, it's a completely different ball, kettle of fish. Whether you love Donald Trump or hate Donald Trump, if you're an United States citizen, he is your president. Justin Welby is the head of a foreign church. He is not the Pope of Anglicanism. He's the first among equals within a group called the Primates Council, and he calls a meeting. He has no, he has never, except for that short sliver of time, from the 1920s up until the 1980, until the 1998 Lambeth Conference, right. had any sort of greater role. One of, the, one of the lies, and I speak as an Oxford-trained historian of 19th century Anglicanism, one of the lies that is perpetuated is this that we are a church somehow gathered under the Archbishop of Canterbury. Tell the Church of England this, because they didn't know that until the modern era when they invented General Synod. This is nonsense. It's well, historical nonsense. Kevin, this is a great time to revisit that, that lie. The four instruments of unity have been uh, proposed upon us for the last 25 years. It started, at, from what I understand, a document at VTS. It's never an official vote. Uh, or anything like that, but Instruments of Unity. First is Archbishop of Canterbury. Second, Primates. Third, Lambeth Conference. Uh, the fourth is uh, the ACC. And I have not seen any active leadership in the uh, Office of Unity from any of those four structures uh, to hold this church together other than by documents. And <clears throat> well, we're, we're back we're, we're back to one of the, 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 the meta narratives that we've been dealing with in this show, which is um, what is the broader context in, in Christendom and the Western world? In other words, what, what would you have unity over and for? It, it used to be that unity was essentially a response to, to Protestant schism. So the, the centrifugal force that flung churches apart at the Reformation was something that needed to be recovered and helped and, and, and healed to some extent. And, that would be a very noble and proper pursuit. But we've entered into a period of a new, where, where a new reformation is required. We're, we're no longer gathering up the, 
the, the, the fractures of an old Reformation, we are in the middle of an, an immensely important worldwide crisis, which in, and in some places of the world it's killing Christianity, either by persecution or in the West by dissolution and compromise. So the, the issue I don't think anymore is about instruments of unity. It's really, it ought to be instruments of faithfulness. The great division is between Christians who are going to be faithful to the gospel, and that solid tradition, and Christians who go with the dissolution of tradition. And the trouble with the Archbishop of Canterbury is that, that, that he ha if you're going to put him into the narrative, he's leading people away from the gospels. He's leading the charge into dissolution. And that, you know, we, there's no point in talking about him as an instrument of unity. We ought to ask whether or not he's being faithful to the church or, I'm afraid, a traitor to the church. I'm sorry to use that language, but in my mind, the issue is so stark that those who are being traitors to the gospel and selling out to culture ought to be called out in that way. And there needs to be a regathering of the orthodox in order to find, and then here's the challenge you laid us, which was really quite difficult, in order to find within a workable ecclesiology a new identity of fidelity to Jesus. The problem is it's difficult if you're a Protestant group to find an ecclesiology that can do that. And I think the conversation we've been having about the Global South and GAFCON is a symptom of that. The bells have ceased. Oh, finally, George. <laughs> I hope they don't do that at midnight. Um, and there's the reality we, we, we sit at right now as we're closing out the, the, the show. What makes a church? You know, clearly, it's the people. Clearly, it's what you believe. And we, we look for good documentation and doctrine of what we believe. I don't see a common, cohesive, Anglican-wide doctrine. It's just it's not printed anywhere. I see it in GAFCON. I see it in this Global South Covenant. I see it in other structures. I see uh, the Roman Catholic Church has no trouble publishing their full uh, Catholic understanding, uh, including dogma. Uh, they're fighting the same battle in a and slightly now different they're, way. Now they're starting to fight the same battle. What is going on, George? Oh, no, that's this what happens. <laughs> <laughs> this is, these are my, my Angelus Bell. This is... Uh, my bell chiming yeah uh, if, if i can find the cat and he will meow if i need to compete with your noises but uh you know he, what makes a church it will probably be a, a, another show another time but you know at the end of it we have the primates going to be flying into kigali for 2020 uh the other bishops and primates will be uh, flying into lambeth for 2020 what do the kigali uh, primates have to decide george They don't really have to decide anything because they're already doing the right thing. Okay. They're being faithful to Scripture. They're being faithful to the revelation of Jesus Christ. They need just to keep on going to keep on going, in my opinion. Sure. And I don't, I, you know, Lambeth at this stage, it was a relevant, ni uh, in 98, I uh, forecasted that would be the last Lambeth conference. And 2000, uh, 2008, Kevin and I were there, and we said, "This is a, this is not a Lambeth conference." <laughs> it was a and joke. this this upcoming conference <laughs> is will have bishops talking about climate change and Yay. mosquito nets. Is there any now, truth in the rumor that Greta Thunberg has been invited? Oh, she to has be, to uh, be there. And <laughs> well, I, you know, not only that, the they will make the her a lay bishop. <laughs> the, 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 the Catholics have the Pachamama controversy and icons. We'll have the Greta Thunberg icons <laughs> all around Canterbury. I hope they have that. Have you seen that new uh, uh, building size picture they have of her where she looks like Big Brother, Big Sister, uh, staring down on San Francisco? I'm going to put a little image of that up right now. Um, it's amazing what we can do to uh, use symbols of children to, uh, uh, to guilt us into uh, perf to, to the government's ways. Guys, we've gone 40 minutes. Have we missed anything? Uh, oh, here, before I, Gafcon, if you have a different take on the story, give somebody uh, that I can interview. Get, contact me this week. I'll put them up before I go on vacation. Uh, Global South, if you want to talk about the, the covenant, send somebody my way. We will put you on Skype. We will do an interview and talk this in full. 
from the 30,000 foot level looking down on what's happening, I see a war in heaven. I see a little war between GAFCON and a little war between the Global South. And I've been doing this a long time now. That war has existed for the last 10 years. It's not a new war. It just, it seems that they're dotting their I's and crossing their T's. And some people within GAFCON are picking winners and they're not picking GAFCON. That's my 30,000 foot view. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Congo. I'm Gavin Ashton, and you've been listening to episode 548 of Anglican Unscripted on St. Martin Day. We could do with another St. Martin. <laughs>